All right, now Joshua chapter number 17. As we've been doing with many of the other passages, I'm not intending on reading through every verse again. Now, last week we saw the, basically the inheritance given to the children of Ephraim, and this week now is dealing with Manasseh. And it's, it's basically highlighting the area of Manasseh that's on this side, Jordan, not on the other side, Jordan. You know, the, the land was already divvied up and, and given out to the half of the tribe of Manasseh when, uh, before they crossed the Jordan River, when Moses was still alive, and he gave, uh, divvied up that land on the other side, Jordan. And uh, half of the tribe of Manasseh received a portion there, and now the other half is receiving their portion on this side of the River Jordan. And basically, it goes through a lot of the towns and, and gives you the boundaries and things like that. But there's, there's one thing in particular that comes up, and we're going to dig and kind of dive down deeper into this subject, and it has to do with Zelophehad and his daughters. And there's you know, a few things that we could learn uh, about just this portion or this aspect of God's law about how the inheritance worked and ultimately kind of boiling down again to, to gender roles and, and men and women and, and God's big plan for, for how nations should operate and, and the way that he wanted things to be. So uh, there's going to be some things that aren't politically correct, but we don't care as long as they're biblically correct is what we care about here tonight. That's why we're in church. That's why we're reading from the word of God and not listening to political news. Now uh, let's jump in here. Look at verse number two. The Bible says, There was also a lot for the rest of the children of Manasseh by their families, for the children of Abiezer, and for the children of Helech, and for the children of Azrael, and for the children of Shechem, and for the sh children of Hefer, and for the children of Shemida. These were the male children of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, by their families. And it points out and says these were the men children, right? There were women children born too, but it's the men children that receive the inheritance. This is the way... In God's economy and God's, you know, nation that he decided for things to be done is that property was going to pass down along the male line. And we're going to get into this a little bit more and why this actually makes sense. Because people today might freak out, oh man, I can't believe you're so, you know, uh, misogynistic and, and, you know, you're, you're a male chauvinist and all this other stuff and you know, the, the feminist movement is, you know, hates the patriarchy, which is just means, you know, there's a father run household, right? And, 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 a, and, a, and a male dominated as far as leading and ruling and, 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 you know, performing that function. But this is the job that God has given unto men. And like I said, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but I just want to point out right off the bat in verse number two, that it's, it, it, it's specifying these are the male children that are receiving the inheritance by the word of God, that they're the ones receiving the inheritance. Look at verse number three. The Bible says, But Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Maker, the son of Manasseh, had no sons but daughters. And these are the names of his daughters. Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Tirza. So as we're going through this and he's saying, okay, you know, this family gets this portion, this family, this, you know, this son, this son, this son receives this inheritance. Well, we get to a man that doesn't have any male descendants in order to receive his inheritance. So it's, a, it's kind of a special case to say, well, what do we do here? Because normally the firstborn son receives the double portion of, of the inheritance of the father, and then the other sons receive a single portion. So what that normally would, and you could see that with the the tribe of Israel, or with the, you know with the with the children of Israel when Israel is giving out his blessings, and he, and um, he ended up making Ephraim receive the double portion over Manasseh, even though Manasseh was the firstborn of the children of Joseph. But um, again, I don't want to get too far into that because I actually think I have that in my notes as well. So keep your 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 place here. And flip over to Numbers chapter 27. We're going to look at um, these few places where this instance is actually referenced as far as the daughters of Zelophehad. 
because this comes up and, and is dealt with in multiple places in the Bible. It's not just a one-off thing. It actually comes up multiple times. So there's something to be learned from this story and from this aspect of God's law. I'm going to read. I don't think we read verse number four from Joshua 17. I'll, re I'll read it again for you. It says, And they came near before Eleazar the priest and before Joshua the son of Nun and before the princes, saying, The Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance among our brethren. Therefore, according to the commandment of the Lord, he gave them an inheritance among the brethren of their father. So this particular chapter, Joshua 17, it doesn't go into all the details, but it references the fact that this has already been brought up. It's already been established by God. Hey, these daughters need to receive an inheritance as he's giving out inheritance to all the men children. That the daughters need to receive an inheritance also because their father had no sons and basically they don't want his portion to just go away and just like never exist and that his name would just cease to exist. Uh, Numbers 27, verse number one, we're going to see this reference again to Zelophehad and what is to be done with that. So verse number one, the Bible reads, Then came the daughters of Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Maker, the son of Manasseh, of the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, and these are the names of his daughters, Mala, Noah, and Hogla, and Milcah, and Tirzah. And they stood before Moses, and before Eleazar the priest, and before the princes, and all the congregation, by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Our father died in the wilderness. And he was not in the company of them that gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah, but died in his own sin and had no son. So basically what they're doing is they're saying, look, our dad was one of the people that died wandering in the wilderness right over during that 40 years. And he wasn't one of the people that rebelled against Moses. He wasn't one of those wicked, you know, false prophets that were just completely contrary, opposing Moses, that where the, the earth opened up and devoured them and they went straight down into hell. He's, they're like, look, our dad wasn't one of those people, okay? Because if he was one of those people, then they would have really no grounds to stand and say, hey, our, our dad's name is going to die out. Well, yeah, the posterity of, of Korah and all his family, they were all devoured and swallowed up and they were left with nothing. So you wouldn't expect someone that was on that side to really be left with anything. But they're saying that's not the case. He, you know, he died in his own sin. He had his own sins. He died in the wilderness. You know, he didn't make it into the promised land. But he wasn't one of those people, so we shouldn't allow his name to just, just be done away. Look at verse number four. That's what it says. Why should the name of our father be done away from among his family? Because he hath no son. So just because he didn't end up having a son, why should his name just go away? Give unto us, therefore, a possession among the brethren of our father. Now, um, having your, your name not die out is, uh, you know, it's, it's an important thing. You, you want to you wanna keep your name around and be remembered. You know, w we don't have very much in this life. You know, physical possessions come and go. But your name, meaning like what your name stands for, who you are, when someone references your name, what they think about you, what's said about you, that carries a lot of weight. That's really important because it kind of defines who you are. The amount of influence you have, the, you know, hopefully it's good, it's positive, right? You want to have a good name. When people talk about you, you want them to be able to say, oh yeah, you know, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, they were really godly, they lived a righteous life, they helped people, they gave the gospel, they did, you know, all of these good things. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, one, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. It's way better to strive in this life to live a righteous, upright life, to have that good name. It's way better to have that than to have, you know, a bunch of riches, a bunch of gold. You know, maybe you could earn and, and get some great amount of riches, and, and you, but you have to lie and, cheat and ste uh, steal <laughs> and cheat in order to do so, right? You have, to, you have to do it the wrong way, but hey, you can amass all this wealth and get all this gain. And the Bible's saying, you know, well, then you're going to be known by that. And those riches, they're just going to come and go. It's not going to provide you the happiness. It's not going to provide you joy. And it's really not going to provide you any honor or dignity or anything worth having in this life just by having some stupid riches. 
There's a lot of people that get rich by swindling others. A lot of people that practice, you know, very shady tactics in order to gain, to gain wealth. But you know what always happens to those people? The things always come out in the end. The truth is always revealed. Their end is not as good as their beginning. They always end up, you know, being taken down. It's not worth risking your reputation and risking your name over just a little bit of money temporarily. Or even if it wasn't temporary, it's still not worth it because money is going to do you no good. Just as a side note, if you, if you have problems in your life, everyone has problems in their life. Don't think that your problems are all tied up in money. Let me repeat that. Don't ever think that your problems are tied up in your money or lack thereof. Because there's, they're not. It's a, it's, it's a false projection or a false object of your source of problems if you think that all of the problems that you experience in life have to do with money. Because I'll tell you what, if you think that that's your problem, if you think that, oh man, I'm having all these issues, we're having a bad marriage, we're having this, we're having that, we're having all these problems because of our financial situation. It doesn't matter how much money you have, you will still have problems. The money will not make that go away. You will continue to continually deal with, with other things that come up and still think, oh man, I don't know, if we just had a little bit more money, if we just had a bigger house, if we just had this, if we just had that, then things would go well. Then we'd be in better shape. If that's your mindset, it's never going to be better. Never. Because that's not what it's all about. You can be extremely happy and have a great marriage, have great relationships, have everything going your way and be dirt poor. You could have a great name, a great reputation. You can, you can help people out. You can have great relationships and have very little money. And on the flip side, there's plenty of people out there that have the exact opposite. They have tons of money, but they're a crook. Nobody wants to be around them. You know, their family despises them. They have bad relationships and they're miserable. No joy. Because it's not about money. It's not about finances. If you can, if you can get that down in your life, it's going to make a, a, a world of difference in your day-to-day -day activity, your day-to-day -day life, and just your outlook on everything. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs, you know, good name is rather to be chosen. If you have a choice between, well, should I have a good name or should I have great riches? Go for the good name. That's what you want to have. Now, the children, the daughters of Zelophehad now, they're, they're concerned. They said, you know, our father, yeah, he's had his own sin, but he doesn't deserve to have his name just completely wiped out and to just lose all inheritance for his, for his heirs and for his name just to be forgotten because he didn't happen to have a son. I mean, he had five daughters, but he didn't have a son. So they approach Moses with this situation, and then Moses goes to God. Look at verse number five there. You're still in Numbers 27. Numbers 27, verse number five. And Moses brought their cause before the Lord. So Moses says, yeah, you know, you got a point. Let me go and ask God about this and see what God has to say about it. Verse number six, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, the daughters of Zelophehad speak right. Saying they're right. What they're asking you for is right. They're, 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 they're bringing unto you a righteous cause. It's good and it's right. So now God's going to instruct him. He says, Thou shalt surely give them a possession of an inheritance among their father's brethren, and thou shalt cause the inheritance of their father to pass unto them. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a man die and have no son, then ye shall cause his inheritance to pass unto his daughter. So this is a command of God. Now it's kind of a special case. Right, because normally it passes unto the son, but in this instance, he's saying, "No, we're going to um, have the inheritance then pass unto the daughter, and it passes unto the daughter before it ever goes to any other heir." So, like, if there's next of kin, right? If the if the father had a brother, or if, you know, if there's other male uh, relatives in the family, 
if there's no son, it goes to the daughter first before any other male. Now, the reason why I'm pointing this out is because people can mock or have a hard time and, and you'll have a lot of critics, a lot of God-hating critics, mind you, but critics of the Bible will say, oh, you know, the Bible is just against women and all this stuff. It's not against women. And when you understand a little bit more of, of the reasoning with why, like, like this makes sense on so many levels for God to, to set things up the way that he did. Uh, keep your place here. We're going to come back to Numbers 27. Turn, if you would, real quick to Luke chapter 15. So the inheritance passing unto the sons. I'm going to explain a little bit why this just makes sense in the way that God designed everything. And if we could just by faith accept the word of God as being the best thing, the most righteous thing, that there is no better way than what God has given unto us, we would be way better off instead of saying, oh, no, that doesn't make sense to me. You just hate women. You just don't want women to have anything. Like, no, no. There, there's a purpose for everything all of this and it, and it makes perfect sense and god you know the bible says first of all in jesus christ there's ni neither male nor female bond nor free circumcision or uncircumcision in christ none of that ultimately really matters god holds the value how much a, a woman is worth equal to the value of a man in God's economy, they are both extremely precious and valuable, and he knows the number of hairs on the head of men and women, boys and girls, and loves them both equally. However, there is a difference between men and women, and God did not design men and women to do the same exact jobs, to do the same exact things on this earth. And, you know, just, I'm not going to get too far into that, but the most obvious example has to do with the way that our bodies were created and the fact that women have the capabilities of feeding children and giving and birthing children, birthing, feeding, nurturing children that the man doesn't have. So who do we think should be the primary person in rearing the children and watching over just their their, their their upbringing. If we just go up based off of creation, it seems to make sense that that would be something that a woman should be doing in handling because she's equipped for the job. And when you look at the difference in the strength that men possess, every man possesses over women. By nature, the way that God has designed men to have testosterone and their muscles to be stronger. Doesn't it make sense then? Well, if someone has to go and physically do some labor and work, well, naturally, that should be the man's job because that's what they're built to do. I, look, we're breaking this down to like preschool level. But people today are so brainwashed and twisted around backwards that they think what, we're, what we believe is nuts. And it's like, just open up your eyes to creation. It's the way God made it. And we just need to learn to accept it. And I'll tell you what, if you can just accept these really elementary basic truths, your lives will be better and happier. When you start striving against and trying to change the way that God designed things, the way that God planned things, and you, you fight against that, I don't want to fall, I don't want to be in that role. No, I want to be the, you know, the man says, I want to be the one to stay home and rear the kids, and I'm going to send my wife off to do the hard work. That's not going to be a good situation for you. You're not going to be blessed. You're not going to be happy because you're going to be doing things that God didn't design you to do. You're fighting, you're fighting a stupid battle that you, you're making things way more difficult than it has to be. But if we just fall in the line the way that God designed things, everything would go out better. Now, the sons, the reason why, one reason why it makes a lot of sense for the sons to gain the inheritance of the land, because that's really what we're talking about here is the, the, the possession, the literal physical possession of the land being transferred to the sons. 
Well, one reason why that makes sense is because the sons are going to be the ones that were out working with dad in the family on the land, like doing the hard labor that dad is doing because dad is the man going out and working the land. So when the sons are then growing up, they're going to be the ones taught how to work the land and to provide for their families when they get older. So since they were the ones investing physically and working the land, it would make sense that the inheritance would pass to those that are actually doing that work. Uh, the Bible, just a reference for that in Luke 15, we have the, um, the this is the end of the, the parable of the, of the prodigal son, right? When the, the one son who did right and did good, he gets upset at the son that left. He wasted all the inheritance. He's spending a riotous living. And then he comes back and his dad throws him a party, right? He kills the fatted calf. He's all happy. So the, the, the son that was doing right gets disgruntled. He's kind of upset. He's like, why, why, should, why should he get anything? He wasted everything. You know, what are you, what are you doing this for? So in... Uh, in this conversation with his father, verse number 29 here in Luke 15, the Bible says, And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friend. So he's basically saying, look, I've been doing everything right. He says, I serve thee these many years. So he's been working for his father. He's been working on the land, working for his father these many years. I've been working for you. And you didn't even like, you didn't even give me a kid. And now you're giving a fatted calf to, to this guy who, who went out and, and he's, he's, he left us here alone to do all the work ourselves. But look at the response. It says in verse 30, But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. Verse number 31, And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. So he basically, you know, hey, yeah, he wasn't here for the work, but now everything is yours. He already received his inheritance gone. He's not getting that inheritance. He's not receiving any more from that. You're going to get everything. But this is just one example. This is, I know this is like you know, a parable, but whatever. It's still describing what was normal at the time. It's just one example of sons working with their father and then receiving that inheritance. And it makes perfect sense. That's one reason why that makes perfect sense. Also, turn back if you go to, to Numbers 27. Also, the men are the providers for the family. And that is by God's word also. That a man is to provide for his own, especially they have his own household. And if they don't do that, the Bible says that they're worse than an infidel. They're worse than an unbeliever. If you don't, if you don't work and provide for your own family. So if the men are to be providers for the family, the inheritance is only going to help them in their provision for their family. Wasn't well, it make sense then that that would transfer to the person that is responsible, right? I'm responsible for feeding my family. Well, it would make sense then that I receive that inheritance of that land to make sure my family is fed. Nowhere do we see God putting that responsibility on a woman, on the wife, to say, oh, you're responsible for making sure your husband's fed. Not one time. It's always the man's job to do that. Uh, Numbers 27, let's jump down to verse number 9 there. Let's keep reading. The Bible says, And if ye have no daughter, then ye shall give his inheritance unto his brethren. And if he have no brethren, then he shall give his inheritance unto his father's brethren. And if his father have no brethren, then he shall give his inheritance unto his kinsmen that is next to him of his family, and he shall possess it. And it shall be unto the children of Israel a statute of judgment as the Lord commanded Moses. So he continues on down the line, basically, that there's no sons or daughters. It just it essentially is just going to next of kin. That they, they really want to make sure that that name, that that family, that that tribe doesn't lose their inheritance, that they don't lose their land and then ultimately become peasants because they have no property, they have no means of sustaining themselves. He wants to make sure that every tribe, every family has their own portion and has their own land and that it's not just taken away from them just by means of, you know, not having children or not having a son or something like that. So he keeps it within the family. Now flip over ahead to Numbers chapter 36. 
God set up this system for mankind to follow. And as I mentioned before, God's ways are perfect. But as with all of God's laws, there are people who will misinterpret and or find fault with his ways. And what we're going to see here in Numbers chapter 36 is another detail that's added to the rules governing this inheritance of land. So it goes another step further because now it's already been decided that the daughters are going to receive this land as inheritance in order for their father's name to continue and that they don't lose that, uh, that land from their family. But there's another caveat here. Verse number one of number 36, the Bible says, and the chief fathers of the families of the children of Gilead, the son of Maker, the son of Manasseh. Again, this is all through that same line because this is the line that Zelophehad came from. Of the families of the sons of Joseph came near and spake before Moses and before the princes, the chief fathers of the children of Israel. And they said, the Lord commanded my Lord to give the land for an inheritance by lot to the children of Israel. And my Lord was commanded by the Lord to give the inheritance of Zelophehad, our brother, unto his daughters. And if they be married to any of the sons of the other tribes of the children of Israel, then shall their inheritance be taken from the inheritance of our fathers and shall be put to the inheritance of the tribe whereunto they are received. So shall it be taken from the lot of our inheritance. So now we see another aspect of God's law is basically is that when a woman marries a man, she goes and becomes part of that man's household. The man doesn't go and join unto the woman's household. The woman essentially becomes part of the man's family. Like that is who she becomes a part of. And what they're concerned about here is that, well, now these women possess this property, but once they get married, that husband's going to have rightful control and ownership of the land because he's the head of the household. He's the one in charge of everything. He's the one who has the ownership of everything that is his wife's. Wait, yes, you heard me say that right. The husband has the ownership of everything that was his wife's in the household. That is the way that God designed the family to operate. That is the authority that God has given unto the man. We're not going to turn there, but if you remember a few weeks ago, we already looked at the passage where God has given so much authority unto the man in the relationship as husband and wife that he can disallow a vow made by his wife unto God. That even when it comes to a personal relationship between the woman and God, if she makes a vow or a promise saying, God, I'll do this, I'm vowing to do this, that the husband can veto that and say, no, you're not. That is an extreme level of authority that God has given to the man. And, and Christian homes today, every home today, Christian or not, would do really well to take heed to the way that God has designed things. So many fights, so many breakups and separations and divorces would not exist if people can follow these simple, and I say simple because it's not complicated. In our culture, it's difficult for women, especially, to allow for this type of authority to be given unto the man that God has given to the man. It's difficult because it goes against everything that women are taught in the United States of America. That's why it's, di but it's simple. It's a very simple concept. And yes, I said to allow the man to have the authority. Just because God has given that authority doesn't mean that they automatically are uh, perceived and respected and listened to as having that authority. Think about it this way. God has given authority to human government to do certain things. Does that stop human government from just getting out of control and, and stepping over their bounds and doing things that they're not supposed to do? Of course not. See, God doesn't force that on us. He gives us free will. He gives us a choice to either listen to him and do what he says or to not do what he says. And when it comes to authority and power, ultimately, those are invisible things. They're invisible. A man can only do so much, 
But if the, if the wife doesn't want to be under that authority, at the end of the day, she doesn't have to be. She can do whatever she wants by choice. But by not obeying the authority given by God, she is in sin and in transgression and wrong. And, you know, again, not going to be happy, not going to be blessed and going to cause all kinds of problems. But this is the way that God designed things to operate within the government, within the home, within inheritance, that this is the way it operates. So their concern is that when they marry another man, he's going to have control of this. And that's going to ultimately take that if they marry someone from another tribe, right? So they're from the tribe of Manasseh. And they say, hey, I want to get married to this guy. This guy's of Judah. And they say, okay, well, let's get married. Because there were no other restrictions among the children of Israel. It's not like you had to marry within your tribe in Israel. Like you, you, you didn't have to just marry someone of this tribe. That's not the, that wasn't the way it was. You could marry basically whoever you wanted to marry. But in this particular situation, because that is going to actually have an impact, because women weren't supposed to be the owners, right? And, when, and see, here's the thing. If, he, if God would have allowed men and women to have this property ownership, then you do start getting into more problems of, well, who does it belong to when there's a marriage? And, excuse me, and who, you know, when you split it up or whatever. But if it's only assigned to the men, then it's always going to stay within that realm. So regardless of this intermarrying between tribes, it doesn't matter because it's going to stay within that same lineage. And it keeps things pretty simple and straightforward. It doesn't get all complicated and convoluted. This is the most complicated it gets. As well, there's no sons and there's daughters. So they have to resolve this somehow. And they ultimately, we're going to read that in a minute, but they just say, well, you just have to marry someone within that tribe. And that solves the problem. But um, flip over real quick to Genesis chapter number five, because it's we need to see this and be reminded of this, that this isn't God's word. This isn't Pastor Burson saying, yeah, Pastor Burson just wants to have all the power at home and and power over his wife, so he's just going to preach on this, and, you know, whatever. And it's just, it's just all out of his own wicked heart that he wants to have this dominion. Uh, no. We're preaching the Bible tonight. We're, we're looking at God's Word and the way that he designed things. So, um, the man being in charge and owning, in, in almost, in a sense... I want to try to say this the right way. Not because I'm worried about what people might think as far as being upset or offended by this, but just to be pretty accurate. With the level of authority that God gives in the household between the husband and the wife, it's not that the man owns his wife, but just about, like that's kind of, the, I mean, that's like the level of authority that God's given. The Bible doesn't use it as just, as if the, the one's just some piece of property. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it's not trying to dehumanize the, the wife or the woman. But just with that level of authority that God has given over his wife and over the possessions and everything else. And, um, and even just going back to the creation of the woman... Um, you know, the woman leaves the house of her family to become one flesh with her husband and to take his name. So, I know we have some weird things going on today where you've got men dropping their names and taking their wives' last names and hyphenating names and doing all this stuff because they're trying to be politically correct. And that is the stupidest thing ever. You get people just, just hyphenating names and we're going to keep hyphenating and hyphenating and hy like, like, what if you continue that down and say, well, the right thing to do is just to hyphenate and combine names. So let's hyphenate. And now our kids, when they get married, they're going to hyphenate. Well, the kid's last name is already going to be hyphenated, right? So, <laughs> so what, what if they do that and then they hyphenate from, from, you know, like, let's say you have a son and his name's hyphenate. And then, oh, he meets this girl. Well, now we're going to add another hyphen 
to our last name, and then we're going to pass that on to our children, right? So you're going to end up with this, this string of just this super long name. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. But see, God gave us the example in Scripture. Genesis chapter 5, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. It doesn't say he called his name Adam. It says it calls their name Adam. Why? In chapter 5, this is after they have already established, you know, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Husband and wife come together. They become one person, one flesh, and the wife takes the name of the husband. That's the biblical model. And it makes sense because the husband is the one in charge of everything. He's the head of the household. The head of the household is known by the name. The name of the father they didn't want to have get lost. The name is what wants to uh, continue on. That name, it's the name of the husband. It's the name of the leader. The husband is supposed to be the one directing the family and saying, we're going to go this way. That's why... The wife was even created because it wasn't good for the man to be alone. Flip back to Genesis chapter 2. The woman falls under the house and authority of her husband. And basically she goes from being under the house and authority of her father because dad's in charge to leaving father and mother to going then under the authority of her husband. And her, her, her entire identity is tied to her husband by taking his name. And as it says here, look at Genesis chapter 2, 18. The Bible says, and the Lord said, uh, the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. This was before Eve was created. The reason why God created woman was to be a help for the man. For the man not to be alone and to help the man. This is what the Word of God says. You don't have to like it. I, I love it. And it's not just because I'm a man. I just love it because it's the Word of God. Because God tells us the truth. But this is also why, when I was speaking, this does not degrade or devalue women at all. It's just their job. It's just a job. Now you say, yeah, but their job isn't as, uh, you know, as glamorous or, or, or isn't as honorable or whatever. Well, how often in Scripture do you find that the, the least comely things, the less honorable things in this world are the ones that God elevates even more and honors and exalts? Those that have less abilities, God exalts. Those that, have, you know, that are put in a worse position, hey, God's fighting for them. More than anyone. I mean, that is a theme throughout all of Scripture. And if you don't know that, you haven't read your Bible one time ever. It's not a bad thing at all to be a woman in, in God's society in the way that God planned things. But I'll tell you what, women, if you, you know, if you take on that role and take on that supporting role, your marriages, your relationships are only going to improve and get better and better and better and better over time. Because that's the way that God designed things to be. I mean, think about it. It's, you know, it, it's an, and it's an important... This isn't something to just be overlooked or just tossed aside or whatever. Not that big of a deal. Because this has to do, if you're married, this has to do with your life. For men and women. How, what direction are you going to go with your life? Everyone has a will. Women have wills. Men have wills. Right? In a marriage, though, you can't go two different directions. That doesn't work. That's not a marriage. That's not a union. That is not being joined together and acting as, you are, as God has brought you together as one flesh when you're starting to do this. That is why God put, had to put one person in charge. 
Because if you take a vote between two people, there's no tiebreaker. <laughs> you don't leave that up to the kids. <laughs> there needs to be someone in charge. Otherwise, what you're going to have is fighting back and forth. And it's not, well, whoever is right. You're both going to think you're right. I mean, that's, that, otherwise, you wouldn't be disagreeing. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a problem if you, if you both didn't think that you were right. But that's also why God said, no, the man's in charge. Not as long as he's right. Not as long as he always chooses to, to do the right thing. That's just it. That's the bottom line. He's the one that's in charge. And God created Eve, God created the woman to help and to be a help meet or suitable for the man. Because the man's deciding the direction of the family. The man's in charge of the finances. The man's in charge of how the home is to be operated and doing the work while the wife is raising the children and keeping the home and doing the things that God has designed her to do. And when you have a husband and a wife joined together in acting as one flesh, so much more can be done for, for the glory of God. This is why it's so important to find a good spouse. If you're unmarried, Find someone who wants to serve God. Women, find a man that's going to, that loves God's word, that's going to be the provider, that's going to look out for you, that's going to want to serve the Lord and lead your family that way. Then you don't have to worry about, well, which way are we going to go in life? Find the man that's going to be going the right way that you want to go. And then once you find that man, you have to follow him. Once you make that vow, there's no... There's no turning back and saying, well, no, I changed my mind. I actually don't want to do this anymore. I mean, you, you have, you'll have the choice to do it, but you know what it's going to lead to? More fights, more problems. You know, it, it causes more damage. Just nothing is going to be happy, joyful, or whatever. It, it's, it's like flushing your life, life down the toilet. It's a, it's a large theme or, or doctrine or teaching in the Bible that as this world gets more and more wicked, can be harder to deal with because of all the brainwashing, because of the culture. But it is so important. I mean, your family unity, your family strength, that is ultimately what's going to keep you going and serving God anyways. I mean, it's going to, you know, the church, yes, the church is important. Yes, everything else is important. But at the end of the day, your family is, is your, your core of, of, of strength. And if your family's screwed up, it's going to be so much harder to even make it to church to even start to do the right thing when everything is just backwards at home. Let's go back to, uh, or actually, where are you? Number, numbers 36, we're still in Numbers 36? Or Genesis? Go back, if you would, to Numbers 36 real quick. Numbers 36. In verse number three, they were expressing their concern, saying, wait a minute, you know, if they, if they marry other people of other tribes, then the inheritance is going to be removed from us. So verse number four, it says, and when the jubilee of the children of Israel shall be, then shall their inheritance be put into the inheritance of the tribe whereunto they are received. So shall their inheritance be taken away from the inheritance of the tribe of our fathers. And Moses commanded the children of Israel according to the word of the Lord, saying, the tribe of the sons of Joseph hath said, well. So he's saying that's another good point that's brought up. And that's going to be dealt with also. Verse number six, this is the thing which the Lord doth command concerning the daughters of Zelophehad, saying, let them marry to whom they think best. Only to the family of the tribe of their father shall they marry. Now, um, and then it's saying that that's going to solve this problem. The inheritance is going to be removed. Go back to Joshua chapter 17. But one last point on this, because people will have a, a wrong impression or understanding of the Bible. Even though the things that I already mentioned are enough to make people just make their head explode these days, 
There's also a lot of false accusations and just not understanding of the Bible at all that get thrown out there. Like, so someone might say, oh, well, the Bible says, you know, it believes in like arranged marriages and stuff, you know, things like that. And it's like, no, it doesn't. When you see when uh, Abraham sent out his servant to find a wife for his son, did he go and like buy a wife? Or did he go and just say, that's it, you're coming with me? No, she had the choice to go. And they talked to her family about it. And they talked to her about it and say, okay, well, do you want to go and do this? Yes, it was up to her. She went and did it. It wasn't forced upon anyone. And even in this situation, they say, well, let them marry who they think best. And it's talking about the women. Let them marry who they think best. This isn't just saying you just have to marry this person and this is all arranged and women have no right and no say in who they get married to. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Let them marry who they think best. The only condition that's being put on this scenario is just you, you got to find someone in the tribe of the house of your father. Now, the tribe's pretty big. I mean, it's like in, in an entire state or region or city, right? Like you've got this big area. Like, can you find one guy <laughs> in, in, this, in this whole pool, someone in your community to, to marry? I mean, that, that's it. And uh, so they're given a lot of liberty. And even in the New Testament, we have the same concept taught. Uh, I'll just read this for you. 1 Corinthians 7.39. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty. I mean, she has the freedom to be married to whom she will, whoever she wants. But then again, the only limitation or restriction, according to God's word, says only in the Lord. So God gives men and women freedom to marry who they want to marry. Not to get involved in something they don't want to get involved. No, marry who you want, but as a believer, marry someone else who's saved. Marry another believer only in the Lord. That's what's being taught. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of freedom that God gives just overall and in general. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're free to make up any of our choices. We're free to disobey every single one of God's laws and commandments. We're free to do that. But that's not, I'll tell you where now, it's, it's not advisable. It's not a good thing to do. It's not something that's going to reap you any positive benefits. The Bible says, you know, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. You know, we're free, we're free from the curse of the law through Jesus Christ, but it's not, it's not recommended to go out and go, what shall we say there? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God forbid. Of course not. We should use our liberty wisely and choose to do right. And when you choose to do right, God will bless you for that. <coughs> Let's jump down now to Joshua chapter 17, verse number 14. There's one other point I wanted to make. That was kind of the main, the main thrust of the sermon tonight. And the main, what I wanted to focus on was the, the daughters of Zelophehad. But in verse number 14, the Bible says, And the children of Joseph spake unto Joshua, saying, Why hast thou given me but one lot and one portion to inherit, seeing I am a great people? For as much as the Lord hath blessed me hitherto. So now we see, and this is, it's kind of funny, but there's, you know, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim, they're going, hey, why did you only give us one lot? Or, you know, Manasseh specifically, but he's saying, why did, why did you give us only one portion? Like, it was a big portion. And you're only half the tribe, and the other half is on the other side, Jordan. Like, they have, they have a pretty big area, as it is. But verse, look at verse number 15. And Joshua answered them, If thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country, and cut down for thyself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. And the children of Joseph said, The hill is not enough for us. So they're saying, well, that's not even enough for us anyways. We need, we need something more. And they're just going and they say, no, we just need, we're such a great people. We need even more than that. But see, then the real reason comes out why they don't want to take the hill country. Because then it says, and all the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron. Both they who are of Beth Sheehan and her towns and they who are of the valley of Jezreel. So they're saying, yeah, well, well, you know, we're too big for that. You know, can you just give us another area? Because that's really not enough for us to inhabit. And they've got chariots of iron. You know, they've, they've got strong defenses there. It's not going to be an easy victory. It's not going to be a, a fun battle. Can you just give us something easier? I mean, we're such a great people. We just need more room anyways. Well, I like Joshua's answer. It says in verse number 17, And Joshua spake unto the house of Joseph, even to Ephraim, and to Manasseh, saying, 
Thou art a great people. He said, you're right. You are a great people. There are a lot of you. And as great power, you're really powerful. Thou shalt not have one lot only. Yep, I agree with you. You are a great and a mighty people. So no, we'll, we'll give you even more. I agree with you. But then he says, verse 17, but the mountain shall be thine. <laughs> but, but that's what you're going to get. You're going to get that hill. You're going to get that mountain, that wooded area that I told you at the beginning. For it is a wood, and thou shalt cut it down. He's saying, no, you're going to go do this. And the outgoings of it shall be thine. For thou shalt drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots, and though they be strong. He's saying, I don't care if they have chariots of iron. You're a great people. You go up there and, and, and defeat those Canaanites and you get them out of that land and you inherit that land. You were coming to me asking for more. You better go and fight for it. I mean, there wasn't a greater people than, than you know, Ephraim and Manasseh combined, right? They're the, they're the tribe that was blessed and there's great multitude and great people and deserve all this land. Go and stink and fight for it. But they want to have everything and not... Do the battle. And we already saw, I preached on this a little bit last week with, with Ephraim, you know, allowing the people of the land to remain and just become a thorn in their flesh. And um, because they didn't have the full desire to just go out and do it, their heart wasn't completely in it. I mean, if, their heart was, if, they, if they really had full faith, they would say, like Joshua. Joshua knew they could do it. He's saying, go do it. I don't care if they have chariots of iron. I don't care if they're giants. I don't care what the land is like. I don't care if it's difficult. I don't care if they're well defensed. You go and do it. Joshua had that attitude all throughout. And that's why there's so many victories wrought by Joshua. But not everyone followed his lead. Many of them just said, oh, I, don't, I don't really want to do it. You got to choose you this day whom you will serve. We're going to get to that. I'm waiting for that. But uh, that's the attitude of Joshua. Hey, you decide for yourself who you're going to serve. I'm going to serve the Lord. As for me and my also, I'm going to serve the Lord. And, uh, you know, we know that, that we can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And, and we need to remember that. And not be afraid, not back down. Stay in the fight. All right, that's why I read that word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for these stories and, and for your scripture, dear God. I pray that you please help us in these uh, dark times to be able to be beacons of light and to exalt your word and to, to live by your words, Lord, and, um, and to treat them as precious in our sight and to to value your words and your instruction and to just, just cling to your words and, and apply them in our lives, Lord, that, that we can be in, in the best situation, the best position possible and, and be blessed and, and have joy and have peace and have comfort and also um, just bring honor and glory unto your name as a people that, that truly does believe and, and doesn't just pick and choose the areas of the Bible that we want to follow, or we want to listen to, and, and just chooses to not, not, not apply the areas that, that might make us look weird or um, that are not politically correct these days, Lord, but that we're going we're gonna to take the whole thing and we're going to have integrity with your word and, and treat it with, uh, with the care that we ought to. And God, we, we love you. We just ask for your strength and, um, and help us to just continue to learn evermore. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.